So over the last few weeks, we've been allowing God to do this work and to teach us all about abiding in Christ and what that looks like, what that means. And I think this has been a pretty powerful discussion. I've heard some people talk about it. I know it's been a powerful discussion for me. All about this invitation that Jesus extends to us in John 15, where he uses the example of a vineyard, of a vine particularly, and the branches that are attached to it, right? And so using this example, he teaches us to remain in him. And by doing that, that we get to experience this life of a fullness that can only be through him. So like a branch stays attached to a vine, abiding in a relationship with Jesus that is rooted in love, right, is the only way that our lives are going to actually produce good fruit. So the very first week of the series, we talked about Jesus being that one and only true vine. There's only one that's going to give us all the sources that we need, that's going to give us all the nutrients that we need. And then it talked about us being the branches that are attached to the vine, right? And if we want to be able to live that life that God has for us, then we've got to stay attached. The second week, then we talked about and we acknowledged that God is a good gardener. He is a good gardener and he knows what he's doing and he knows just exactly how to prune each and every one of us just in the way that we need it so that we can be free from sin and that we can be his true disciples. And then last week we discovered that every single person is going to produce some kind of fruit with their lives. Some kind of fruit, whether it's good or it's bad. And the good news is we also learned that we can replant a crop, right? That we can sort of start over and replant, replant a crop so that we can have different fruit when we allow the Holy Spirit into us and to be able to do that for us. So today we're going to be looking at the reason of why. <laughs> Why is it that we need to abide in Christ in a way that we can find that fullness of life? And you may say, oh, we've already got that answer, but I want to take you a little bit further and deeper today. So to get started, we're going to read through this scripture one more time. Um, and I know you're probably tired of hearing it by now, but there's still wonderful messages tucked in here that we need to talk about. So I'm going to read through the whole thing so you get the gist of the whole, uh, whole teaching. And if you have been reading the book of John with us over the last three weeks, you should have finished up yesterday if you were doing <laughs> one chapter. I see a couple nods of heads. I want to tell you, if you didn't finish up yesterday, it's okay. Just keep going, right? I want to encourage you to keep going. So this Wednesday when we have Bible study, we're going to be looking through those last few chapters, which are Jesus' arrest and his trial and his death and resurrection, all right? So we're going to be diving into that, which is perfect timing. This is how God does this. It's perfect timing to be doing this because what starts on February 22nd? Lent, yes, right? And that's the whole time that we're building up towards those moments. So we're going to dive into them and we'll start getting our hearts and our minds prepared for that season as well. So let's begin here by reading John 15, 1 through 17. I am the true vine, or true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. I'm just going to stop there for a second because he is talking directly to the 12 disciples. They've been with him now for three years. They've been getting his message. They have been pruned in many ways by this time. But he continues by saying, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce how much fruit? Much fruit. Yes, not just a little bit, but a lot. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me, and this is the key, my words remain in you, right? So knowing his word, studying his word, reading the whole book of John at least, trying to get his word into our hearts. He says, then may you ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Mostly because then we are connected enough to him that we can know his will, we can know his direction for our lives too. So when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, or is that word true again? This brings great glory to my father. I have loved you, even as the father has loved me. So remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. My cup overflows, right? With all that love. 
This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. So in other words, in the way that he has loved, oh, he says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. So in that way, that's how I want you to love each other. In the same way that God has loved Jesus. There is no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. And I like this part because I think he's adding this in here to say, and remember, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. So much fruit and lasting fruit. So that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. Love each other. Why? Because if you are loving each other, then that means that you are remaining in him right? If you are loving the way he's talking about loving, then that means that you are remaining in him. And isn't that the whole big purpose of this teaching is to remain in him, abide, remain, stay with me, he says, because I, as your creator, as your father, as your savior, love you. And isn't love the driving force behind connection, right? Love is what connects us. It's kind of like the, the glue that connects the relationship or the magnet that pulls you together and, and to abide in him. And the reason we choose to remain connected to the vine, the reason we invite, invite, not just allow, but invite God in to actually prune us, and the reason we sensibly assess the kind of fruit that we're producing is because we trust that God fully does love us, like fully does love us, right? And we trust that. And hopefully through all of that trust and recognizing God's love, we too are growing and falling more and more in love with God, right? And so our love for him is growing as well. And Jesus, I feel like, expands on this in a really particular part in this John 15. So I want to, or yeah, I want to just look here between verses 9 and 13 a little closer. Let me read this to you again. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me, right? So that's a lot of love. A lot of love. Just wrap your brain around that for a moment. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. That's how you got to do it. If we're obedient to Christ, then we're remaining in his love, right? That's how we do it. Just as I have obeyed my father's commandments and remain in his love. So I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. So Jesus, what he's doing here is sort of connecting the dots as to why we should remain in connection with him. First, it's because the father loves Jesus, right? And, and Jesus is his first son, his only son, his um, firstborn, if you would, of all creation. He lived in total obedience to the father, right? And he and the father are one. They're not two separate. They're one, one. Then Jesus states that just as God loves him, he loves us in that same way. I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I read this so many times this week that it started to really sink in after a while. <laughs> like, that's a lot of love. Like, I, I just can't get over that, right? That's a lot of love. The way that God loves Jesus and created him and calls him his one and only son and, and does all these wonderful things through him. And Jesus is just this beautiful example of that love of God. And then Jesus says, well, I love you the same way. Like, that's how much I love you. That, that's a lot, right? And the word that Jesus uses to express this kind of love is a Greek word named agape. And agape is a really, really special kind of love. It's not just your everyday love. It's certainly not like, you know, I just love ice cream or I love this or love doing that. It's a way, way deeper kind of love. And it's a love that is very sacrificial, very selfless, and it's a very generous kind of love. The kind of love that, that gives without receiving, that doesn't ever expect anything in return, just gives, 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 and gives. It's an unconditional, sacrificial love. And this word indicates also that this kind of love is a choice. All right, and so wrap your brains around this with me for a moment. God chooses to love Jesus, and Jesus chooses to love us. So overall, God is choosing to love us. He doesn't have to love us, right? He chooses to love. That's why Jesus says, I choose you. Remember, <laughs> you didn't choose me. I choose you. Jesus goes on then to explain the response that, that we ought to have to this kind of love. 
When we fully recognize that we are loved with an agape love, it should just make us so joyful that we can't stand, that we have to absolutely obey Jesus Christ. We are so overjoyed by knowing this kind of love is ours that we just immediately, don't even think about it, you want to absolutely obey on every count, everything that you do. Jesus lived an obedient life, right? So we can do that too. We're so filled with joy. That's the kind of life we should be living, an obedient life. And that, that's a choice that we have to make. That's not something that's going to come automatic. You, you have to choose that. And really on a regular basis, a daily basis. You know, Matt and I have three kids between us, and, and they're getting older. The oldest one's 24. The youngest one's 14 now. But if anyone has children of your own, you know that it's a challenge to get your children to obey. Still can't get my 24-year-old to obey the way I'd like him to, but, you know, <laughs> that's still a work in progress. Right, parents with young adults? No. But, you know, it's hard when parents are trying so hard to raise their kids in the right way, and your kid doesn't want to do their homework, they don't want to clean their room, they're not kind to their siblings, you know, whatever it is, and they're not obeying. It can be very, very frustrating. And I want my kids to respond to my instructions, but I want them to respond because they know that I want what's best for them. And I'm not doing it just to do it. I'm doing it because I want them to be good people and I want what's best for them. I don't want my kids to be robots, to do exactly what I say with no ability to choose. That's not a relationship. <laughs> That's not true connection. I would love for my kids to respond to me because they know that I love them and they know that they can trust me. Love and trust are the only things that will truly cause us as humans to remain fully connected and be obedient to Christ. Love and connection, or excuse me, love and trust are truly the only things that are going to keep us choosing to obey and to connect with Christ. Knowing that we are, are fully loved, loved way beyond measure, right? And that we can trust God with, with literally anything, anything. It's why God gave us free will. You know, you can choose to be obedient. You can choose to not be obedient. That's your choice. You have that choice. God gave us this free will because if we were all puppets on strings, well, that would just be so much control. Nothing would be genuine, right? That's not real love. That's not real relationship. So we're not puppets on strings. You're not made to come to church every single Sunday. You're not forced to do this. You're not forced to do that. You're not forced to love God. You have a choice to love God. You have a choice to come to church every Sunday and worship him. You have a choice to be obedient to him, right? And that's all because God wants real, genuine love. He wants a real relationship with you, not some kind of robotic or puppet kind of relationship. Now, I know some of us may be skeptical because we... Um, we wonder if God truly does love us, right? Like we've made way too many mistakes or we've been too dis or we've been disobedient way too many times and we just wonder is that really even possible? Can he really love me even though I've done all of these things? But I think Jesus anticipated that we would think like that, <laughs> that we humans would get that lie locked in our minds, and that's exactly why he said, well he does here at the last line, there is no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. No greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. What that means is that the cross is proof of love, right? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. Laid his life down for his friends, right? That is proof of love. So Jesus is pointing to this particular part of his life or action in his life for this conclusive proof that we are indeed loved, we are indeed wanted, and that we are so welcome to be in relationship with him. To see this proof, we don't have to look any further. I mean, I, I really was thinking, like, how can I say this about his whole ministry and his whole life and being here? But I don't think we have to look any further than the cross. We don't have to look any further than his death and his resurrection to see how much we're loved, right? Like, that's huge. That's a lot of love. It's there that Jesus laid his life down so that we might have chance at, at new life, so that we might have chance at forgiveness of sin. He proved his friendship. He proved his compassion for us. He proved his love, his agape love, by defeating death at the cross with the cost of his own life. Like, why would he even do that, right? <laughs> what would lead him to do that? Pastor and author Max Licato uh, said it this way about Jesus' motivation to go to that cross and to die for us like that. He says, nails didn't hold God to the cross. Love did. Nails didn't hold God to the cross. Love did. That does wrap it up a lot, doesn't it? 
A relationship based in love causes us to be the best version of ourselves, to be the best version that we can be. It gives us confidence and assurance in who we are and who we are created to be. And you see, Jesus does not just tolerate you. Jesus does not just put up with you. He loves you. He wants you. He invites you into abiding relationship with him. And the Apostle Paul, he wrote about this love, this agape love in his letter to the early church in Ephesus. They were, they were really struggling to keep their faith in God and keep their faith in Jesus. And Paul knew that the one thing that just might change their mind and just might change their whole world is if they understood this kind of love, if they actually got it. So this is what he says. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And I, and I just got to stop there because I had to ponder on that for a little bit. So Paul is praying that God would strengthen us in here first, that he would strengthen us in here, inside our inner being, so that in verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So strengthen us so that we accept Christ in and Christ dwells right here inside me. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, meaning you were created in love, because God is love. It's, it's not just a, a verb, like I love God. It's God is love, like he's a noun, right? That is who he is. He is absolute love, right? And so that means as being uh, children of God, being created by God, that we are established in love, right? We're established by love. We are rooted in that love so deep that it ain't going anywhere, right? And we have trees, and we know a lot of trees don't dig their roots very deep, and a big windstorm can come knock them over. Not this kind of love. This love is so rooted and so deep, it is not going anywhere. And he says, so he prays that being rooted in, and established in love, that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and high and deep is the love of Christ. That blew me away too because I felt like we got to have power to even grasp it, like not truly understand it. Because <laughs> let me just read here a little bit further and you'll see this. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, so you're not going to get it, you're not going to understand it all, all right? But we've got to have power to even grasp it, to even start to understand it. So we've got to have the Holy Spirit in us to be able to even understand that, to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That is a deep prayer. I don't know about you, but that is one that I feel like we could just ponder on and ponder on every day for who knows how long before we truly grasp all of Paul's prayer there. Not only, and this is one thing that came out of this for me, is not only are we invited to abide in Christ, but this means that he abides in us too, right? Like he dwells in us and he abides in us. And you know what? God's love is better than we could ever think. <laughs> I think it's way better than we think. We can't grasp it. We can't understand it all. So it's got to be way better than we can think. Can you think of someone in your life who maybe in the past or maybe somebody currently today who just loves you really, really, really well? Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a parent or a grandparent or a friend. Maybe it's a dog. <laughs> this sounds sad, and I'm not comparing my family to my to my son's dog, but my son's dog, Remy, and I, we have a really good relationship. Like, we see eye to eye. We understand each other. I almost wish she was human, you know, and just going to be around for years and years, but we have this really good relationship, and she really loves me, and I really love her, and you know what? It is pretty unconditional, I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> I can be sad. I can be mad. I can be whatever, and she knows just when to come over and give me a lick on the face, which I love and I don't care. She just licks me in the face and makes me feel so much better. She just knows what to do, or she'll come over and put her head on my lap. I mean, she's just so personable and so wonderful and so cuddly and just, anyways, I know she loves me, and I love her, and we have a really good relationship. Now, I have some family members, too, that I love with this kind of unconditional love, too, and have received. But my question for you is, what are the aspects of that love that you appreciate most? What is it that you appreciate of that person who loves you really well? You know, when love is unconditional, there's, there's nothing that you can do to make that love better, and there's nothing that you can do to make that love less, right? It's just there. Unconditional love convinces us that we are loved literally just because we exist. That dog loves me just because I exist, <laughs> you know? My family, you know, I have a number of people in my family who love me, and I know it's just because I exist. 
That's wonderful love. God loves us just because we exist. We're his children. We're his creation. He says, We're, you're a part of my family, all of you. You're a part of my family. You are my children, he says. The scripture affirms this over and over and over again. In fact, the same author that we've been reading through the book of John here, he wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. I know they weren't very creative when they came up with the different names of the books. But he also wrote 1 John, and this is what he says in there. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. I love that John just stops and puts that in there. He's got to get really real with us for a moment. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. In other words, the world doesn't know his love, right? They're not abiding in him. They're not seeing his love. So they don't see and understand maybe our love too, right? And that could be a whole nother sermon. It's as if though God knew that humans would consistently struggle to believe that we are loved more than we can think, more than we can imagine. And that's why John says this. You know, it's exactly why he says, but that's who you are. You are his children. And see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And John doesn't want us to miss this, this life-changing truth. And the very foundation of the, of the life God longs for us to enjoy and to embrace begins with this conviction, begins with this understanding that God loves us. You know, too often we intelligently accept it. Like we say, okay, yeah, I know that. I sing the song, Jesus loves me. The kids were singing it this morning in church, you know, like or in Sunday school. We get it. Okay, God loves me. But we haven't in reality allowed it to really penetrate our hearts, you know, and not until we understand and we get that love from our knowledge down to our, from our heads to our chest, are we going to actually understand <laughs> that kind of love? And I think until then, we're going to continue to struggle to abide in Christ. We're going to continue to struggle to connect with Christ. God knows that until we see ourselves the way that he sees us, and until we actually accept his love, we will be missing that fullness of God that John's talking about. Maybe this morning you have never made the decision to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you just need to recommit yourself. Maybe you've been distanced from him for a long time and you've known it. You know God's out there. You know he wants you. And maybe you just need to recommit that. Or maybe you've never leaned into that love, to God's love, and to truly embracing that kind of love. So I, I want to offer you this gift today because it's a continual invitation from God all the time for us to be connected to him, for us to abide in him, but also for him to abide in us. And so I'm going to ask you, even if you have the Lord uh, Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I still want everybody to say this prayer with me because I think it's something that will, if all else fails, remind us of who God really is in our lives and how we are connected to him. So if you feel that you have never said this prayer before, I invite you to do that now, but I wanna encourage you, don't just keep it here. <laughs> tell somebody, tell a trusted friend, tell somebody sitting next to you, whatever, tell somebody so that they can help you take those next couple steps to keep developing your relationship and your connection with Jesus. So would you pray with me? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a line and then I'm gonna ask you to uh, say it out loud with me. Let's, let's be verbal about this. Let's be active um, to this great love that we have. So I'll say a line and then you can repeat it, okay? Lord Jesus, I confess my sins and ask for your forgiveness. I acknowledge your great love for me. Please come into my heart as my Lord. Take complete control of my life and help me live in connection with you daily by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and for answering my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.